Welcome to this symposium titled Reframing Sexual Health with Innovative Policy. My name is Ryan Kramer and I'm with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And I will be co-moderating this session with Nicole Burghardt, who is with the California Department of Public Health. We have four great speakers for you today who bring with them a wealth of knowledge and experience of how policy can be used to promote sexual health. Following the final presentation, we will hold a 20 minute uh, live Q&A session with the presenters. So first we have Kellen Baker, the Centennial Scholar with the Department of Health Policy and Management in the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health who will speaking on access to care for the LGBT community. Thank you so much, Ryan and Nicole. I'm very happy to join you today to talk about LGBTQ health access. And just to clarify, when I say LGBTQ, I mean lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender folks, as well as queer or questioning people. As mentioned, I'm with the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where I work on transgender health in particular. So I'm excited to have the opportunity to talk about some of the issues that we see affecting LGBTQ populations in terms of health access. When we look at the health of LGBT populations, and this is something that has been documented, for example, in Healthy People 2020, as well as in an Institute of Medicine report from 2011, LGBTQ populations experience severe health disparities. This is pretty much across the board, looking just at LGBT people versus heterosexual and cisgender people. You can see that self-reported health is consistently poorer for LGBT people as compared to non-LGBT people. Also, odds, for example, of having more than one chronic condition, greater odds of mental distress, greater odds of smoking, and greater odds of at least one HIV risk behavior, which is these are data from the 2014 to 2018 Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. And the HIV risk behavior is actually a composite question that asks about five different sexual uh, risk behaviors over the last year that gives this composite of HIV risk behaviors. These disparities, as I mentioned, are broadly across the LGBTQ population, but it's important to note that they specifically affect some uh, particular groups, such as bisexual people, transgender people, particularly transgender women and transgender women of color specifically, and also people who are black and who are members of other communities of color. These disparities don't arise because LGBTQ people are inherently sick. There are a variety of social, and I would actually add economic and political determinants of these disparities. These, dis these determinants include homelessness, a lack of legal protections, poverty, anti-LGBTQ bias and discrimination, racism and other forms of structural discrimination, a lack of insurance coverage, and a lack of LGBT cultural competence in healthcare. The minority stress model, which was actually developed in the early 1980s, but was popularized by Dr. Ilan Meyer uh, in his work over the last 20 years, identifies where the issues, the barriers that LGBT people encounter in seeking healthcare, how they lie in the pathway from an LGBTQ identity to these poor health outcomes. So this red box here specifically focuses on minority stress processes that are distal, that is, those that lie outside of the individual and that affect their access to care. If we're thinking about the Anderson model of healthcare access and utilization, you could think of minority stress and barriers to care as the opposite of the enabling factors that Anderson describes in talking about how and when and why people use healthcare services. Generally speaking, we divide the barriers that LGBTQ people encounter in trying to access care into three broad levels. These are not exclusive, so there's some overlap or bleed across the different levels, but it's helpful to think about these because each level has different approaches, different strategies that you might use to address these. So the institutional level, that's not just at the hospital level, but broadly at healthcare organizations, such as insurance carriers, as well as at the government level, the policy level at the local, state, and federal uh, levels. Provider level barriers, uh, including those that are interpersonal, so when people are encountering healthcare providers and what are the processes that are happening there that may or may not uh, help LGBTQ people get access to the care they need. And then finally, patient level barriers. Looking at each of these individually, institutional level barriers are these very broad, very widespread factors 
that affect people's access to care at a number of different uh, domains and a number of different uh, settings. So some examples of institutional level barriers that affect uh, access to healthcare services for LGBTQ people are, for example, a lack of available insurance. LGBTQ people are, broadly speaking, more likely to be uninsured than heterosexual and cisgender people. And again, these disparities are worse for bisexual people, for transgender people, and for Black and other people of color. This is particularly true in states that have not expanded their Medicaid programs, since LGBT people are also disproportionately likely to be living in poverty and thus are affected by the unavailability of Medicaid coverage for those who have incomes under 138% of the poverty level. A geographic lack or network inadequacy of services such as gender affirming care, fertility services, and other reproductive health care is also a major problem or an institutional level barrier for LGBTQ people seeking care. Discriminatory policies, broadly speaking, have disappeared from a lot of our healthcare organizations over the last several years. In particular, we might think of the 2010 regulations from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services that prohibited hospitals from imposing different standards or different requirements for same-sex visitors of people in hospital settings versus different sex visitors. Um, this was particularly a problem, obviously, for same-sex couples who are seeking access to their loved ones in the hospital. So for the most part, those types of barriers have disappeared uh, thanks to advocacy and policy change, as well as changing attitudes and practices. But one area where they still remain is in insurance exclusions for gender-affirming care. I know we have Noah Lewis, who um, does a lot of work on this uh, issue, and I'm sure he will talk in more detail about that. And then finally, LGBTQ invisibility in clinical data collection. There is, broadly speaking, a lack of data collection on sexual orientation and gender identity in clinical settings, in, for example, electronic medical records. And that hinders our ability to understand the barriers that LGBTQ people are experiencing. And it contributes to the idea that LGBTQ people, broadly speaking, don't exist in healthcare settings, which simply isn't true. Looking at this map of the states that have expanded their Medicaid programs, you can see those states that are in orange are those that have not. Those are also the states, for example, where we know from census data where the majority of black same-sex couples live. So thinking about people who are already experiencing racism, who are already experiencing poverty, and these folks are disproportionately concentrated in those states in the Southwest in particular, where state Medicaid programs have not expanded. These are also likely to be the states that do not have state level public accommodations, non-discrimination laws. The degree to which public accommodations laws reach healthcare and health insurance can differ by state. But broadly speaking, this is a map, those light states there are those where there are very few protections at the state level for LGBTQ people who are seeking access to, for example, a doctor's office or a hospital. At the federal level, the Affordable Care Act Section 1557, which was part of the ACA when it was passed in 2010, does provide specific protections from discrimination on the basis of sex. A 2016 regulation from the Department of Health and Human Services indicated that that included gender identity and sex stereotyping, which would have protected LGBTQ people. As many are likely aware, the current administration has rewritten this regulation that removes these protections for transgender people in particular. It also removes all other non-discrimination protections for sexual orientation and gender identity from US Department of Health and Human Services regulations. So this lack of clarity about what non-discrimination protections are in place and how people can access them is a major barrier to care for LGBTQ people. Looking now at provider level barriers, this is perhaps the most uh, common barrier that might come to mind when people are thinking about what might stand between LGBTQ people and getting the health care that they need. This includes, for example, interpersonal discrimination. It also includes a lack of provider and staff training on cultural competency in LGBTQ health, as well as uh, cl both clinical and cultural competency, I apologize, on LGBTQ health. And some of the experiences that LGBTQ people have in trying to access healthcare bear out the degree to which people are still experiencing severe discrimination from healthcare providers and other healthcare staff. These, these are data from the Center for American Progress showing, uh, in particular, transgender people reporting high uh, proportion uh, of encounters with physical assault, 
verbal harassment, being denied care, and being turned away from care outright on the basis of their gender identity or sexual orientation. The Center for American Progress, where I was formerly a senior fellow, also did a uh, investigation of Freedom of Information Act uh, filings with the uh, enforcement of ACA Section 1557. And this just shows the percentage of times in these complaints where these different issues were asserted as the cause of the complaint. So for example, denied care because of sexual orientation or HIV status, denied insurance coverage because of gender identity, provided inadequate care because of sexual orientation, and then other uh, issues of interpersonal discrimination, such as being misgendered or experiencing other derogatory language when seeking care. These are some of the faces that are represented by those statistics. At the top is Jay Callio, a transgender man who died of breast cancer after his doctor failed to notify him of his diagnosis because the doctor said he was, quote, uncomfortable speaking to a transgender person. Roxana Hernandez died of complications of HIV in ICE detention after fleeing to the U.S. seeking asylum from anti-transgender violence in Honduras. A pediatrician in Michigan refused to see Jamie and Krista Contreras' baby for a checkup because the physician had preyed on it and decided that she did not agree with their lifestyle. And at the bottom is Kyler Prescott, a transgender uh, adolescent boy who died by suicide a few days before his 15th birthday after being mistreated in an inpatient psychiatric hospital that claimed to be transgender competent. So finally, looking at patient level barriers, in public health, it's often more important to focus on the previous two levels, uh, particularly actually the institutional level, because these are the questions of how do we rearrange, how do we address the social, economic, and political barriers that are keeping people from getting access to care. But it is also important to look at patient level issues that arise. For LGBTQ patients, these might include limited resources, such as time, money, and transportation. Health literacy and knowledge of healthcare need, availability, and access points is also a major issue. A number of organizations in the US have dedicated resources into putting together provider directories for LGBTQ people to help them find clinicians who are both culturally and clinically competent in working with LGBTQ people. For those who don't have access to such resources, it can be hard to find who is the healthcare provider that you can trust when you need healthcare services. Internalized stigma around sexual health and mental health care in particular is also something that keeps LGBTQ people away from services. There is a kind of a tension between providing specific services for LGBTQ people while acknowledging, which is very important, but also acknowledging that some people may not be comfortable attending a healthcare organization or trying to access services from, for example, an AIDS service organization that is specifically branded and specifically well known to be uh, providing HIV care, for example, to LGBTQ people. And finally, care avoidance because of previous experiences with discrimination or fear of mistreatment. Research again by the Center for American Progress as well as other entities such as the Harvard School of Public Health and the US Transgender Survey have consistently found high rates of transgender people in particular declining to seek care, avoiding care even when they need it uh, for acute medical issues because they are afraid of experiencing discrimination. So what are some of the things that can be done? If we had, we could spend all day on this uh, because there is so much work that is underway around the country at a number of levels that is being driven by community members, by allies in order to address these barriers and ensure that everyone, including LGBTQ people, can get the care they need when they need it. But here are some examples of some of the higher priority issues that are really standing in the way of people getting care. One is that all states should expand their Medicaid programs. This is something that has been shown to be associated with improved health. It is critically important, particularly for LGBTQ people living with HIV, that Medicaid services be available in order to help with HIV prevention, care, and treatment. Continuing to introduce reforms to payment and care models to improve accessibility and quality of care. For example, patient-centered medical homes, making sure that there are efforts underway within hospitals, within provider practices, even within health insurance carriers 
to provide the type of holistic healthcare services that see people not just as individual healthcare needs, but as a whole person, including aspects of sexual orientation and gender identity. Applying the Bostock decision, this is the recent Supreme Court decision that found that sex non-discrimination protections in employment include sexual orientation and gender identity, making sure that those apply to healthcare and health insurance. Requiring provider and staff training in both health profession schools and on the job education and training, continuing education for both providers and staff. And finally, collecting data on sexual orientation and gender identity in clinical settings, in administrative data, in population surveys, and in other research to continue to refine our understanding of what are the barriers that LGBTQ people are encountering when they're seeking healthcare services. Further reading, and I welcome any questions or comments. My contact information is here. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you today. Next, we have Michael Horberg, the Associate Medical Director of Research, Medical Education, Community Health, Medicaid, HIV and STD, Genetics and Transgender Health, the Executive Director of the Mid-Atlantic Permanente Research Institute, and Director of HIV, AIDS, and STD at the Kaiser Permanente and Care Management Institute. will be speaking on providing culturally competent care to LGBT populations in a large healthcare system. Thank you so much, Nicole, and thank you, Ryan, and certainly to all, to all those uh, watching in virtual land. Uh, I'm excited today to talk about uh, our efforts to improve LGBTQ population care in a large healthcare system. Just to let everyone know, Kaiser Permanente cares for about 4% of the U.S. population nationally. We are in eight states plus the District of Columbia. We're a tripartite system where we are a part of a non nonprofit uh, health plan and nonprofit hospital systems uh, in uh, Oregon, California, and Hawaii. But also we have exclusive contracts, exclusive arrangements with our physicians who are part of what we call the Permanente Medical Groups to provide such care in an exclusive relationship with the health plans. So Kaiser Plus Permanente, we are committed to providing health care for everyone and we do it as of 12.2 plus million members. In the mid-Atlantic states where I'll be talking about today, we are Maryland, Washington, D.C., and Northern Virginia. We have over uh, three quarters of a million members following all lines of business, including Medicaid. Uh, we do a hub and spoke model, even though we don't own our hospitals out here, as you hear about Kaiser Permanente hospitals on the West Coast, we actually have exclusive relations with certain hospitals where in fact we care for those patients directly. We're supported by a very comprehensive EMR uh, on an EPIC-based system, and that'll be important in what we talk about in a few minutes. And of course, we've been very proud of our NCQA and care ratings for Medicare and, and, and uh, Medicaid, as well as our commercial lines of business. And we're the only health system ever, Kaiser Permanente Mid-Atlantic States, to get, uh, to get a, that 5 over 5 in all lines of business at the same time. So why did we specifically call out LGBTQ care in KP? Well, to be frank, uh, of course we should have. But specifically we have because of those disparities that have even been referred to by Kellen Baker. We see higher rates of STDs, including HPV that can cause cancer, as well as HIV. Higher rates of cancer, higher rates of unhealthy behaviors such as smoking and per nutrition higher rates of behavioral health issues, including mental illness, smoking, inter, inter, intimate partner violence. All these are experienced with both internalized and externalized homophobia, transphobia, queerphobia that really need to be addressed in a comprehensive healthcare system that we pride ourselves to be. Specifically in the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia, uh, metro areas that have an LGBTQ population, strengthening the case for primary care spe services specific to these populations. We see higher rates of complaints even from the DC area in a recent, in a recent data showing higher rates of mental illness, binge drinking, higher of risky behaviors, including unprotected anal sex, therefore increasing our risk for H HIV and other STDs. 
and being treated for an STD recently. All these require to be done in a healthier and frankly, manner that is welcoming to the community, that the community wants to have their care here, and that the, we are, are specifically targeting efforts to improve the care of those communities. So the goals for our LGBTQ practice and clinical guidelines to address was for, is we are looking to uh, in, care for these in seven clinical focus areas, but a special attention also to culturally competent customer service. Our members need to feel welcome. They need to feel they are being heard. They need to feel they are being cared for correctly. So we're going to, to create unique care program with specifically headquartered at our Capitol Hill facility uh, within the District of Columbia. But the goal is to eventually do this for the entire DMV area with elimination of health disparities and improvement of the care. We will have special attention to STI and co-infections, pre-exposure prophylaxis, behavioral health and substance use, immunizations, cancer screening and transgender services, also all within the complex context of high quality general preventive care. You need to treat the whole person, not just segments of the person. So this culturally competent care is going to be followed in a certain plan that we're implementing now. I have to honest, when I was asked first to give this talk, I thought by now I'd be showing you pictures of the clinic, showing you pictures of the area, but obviously uh, a certain pandemic sort of got in the way. Uh, so our, what we're going to be doing is creating this clinical care care program, as I noted, at our Washington, D.C. hub. We're going to be accurately defining the population, which is always a harder matter, and we'll talk about that in a second. We're going to be developing metrics to uh, assess our patients' pro process outcomes, including uh, percent of in-person clinic encounters with the sexual orientation gender identity completed. Uh, our uh, patients up to 45 who got HPV va uh, vaccination documented in the chart, as well as high performance on HEDIS, which is NCQA, how health plans are evaluated, but with this specific attention to the subpopulation. Clinic performance on a customer service survey, and of course, develop communications and a marketing plan to direct members to the clinical center so that we know these patients are going to get the care they need within our larger context. Our clinic will initially have three plus physicians, three full-time primary care plus a part-time ob two dedicated clinic RNs, dedicated clinic assistants that are all been trained, eager to work in this area, and imbued with the uh, principles of quality LGBTQ care. A case manager specifically uh, for the transgender population, but certainly to handle the case management needs of the, of the rest of the, of the clinic population. Dedicated behavioral health and a dedicated program manager, which is critical in a large healthcare system to make sure things run smoothly. We intend to have all physicians will offer PrEP care. I have to be honest, we've had a lower uptake of PrEP than we think the population uh, needs, as well as STD care and counseling. And I apologize for uh, switching back between STI and STD. Um, we go back and forth on the nomenclature. All physicians in our clinic, though, will be WPATH certified. That is important for providing the highest quality LG uh, transgender care. And all, of course, are primary care certified and already have high service scores. We are embedding behavioral health, at least part-time initially in the clinic. Our goal is to embed it more full-time. And, of course, the therapist also will be WPATH certified and especially catered to the LGBTQ community. Additionally, designated specialists in other areas like endocrinology, reproductive services, ob urology, will also be specifically designated within the clinic to ease um, referrals as well as ensuring that the correct referrals and the correct practices are being practiced. 
But as noted, the first and foremost order of business in any organization is identifying your population, identify your community of patients. This is called for us SOGI, and it's a module within our larger uh, EHR system, EMR system. However, it has not been as well taken up as we would like. So we're renewing an emphasis, especially within primary care, but frankly, all departments could be engaged. We're making it easy, but making it essential. And the goal is eventually to provide quality metrics about performance, even within the general clinic population, the general Kaiser Permanente Mid-Atlantic States population, on filling out the SOGI screens within our within Health Connect. And Health Connect is what we call our EHR. But to do that, you got to make it easy to do. One thing we've learned is making the right thing to do the easy thing to do. And as you can see, this is a screenshot from our SOGI form. What you could see is, for, for example, for patients who are heterosexual, bisexual, gay or lesbian, but cisgendered, it's just two clicks, whether gay and cisgendered, and then they're done. And this doesn't even have to be done in an encounter. This could be done, uh, this could be done even when you're just uh, marking down the history. Of course, there's more to do if the patient is transgender, but it's direct, it's all on one screen, and in fact, there are even the opportunity for additional notes. We think that making it easy to do, making it on one screen, in fact, does increase compliance. But of course, we're, if you measure it, they will come. The other thing we've done is we, very early on the uh, last year, Dr. Suma Vupaturi, who's one of our research scientists, research being a critical element in improving the care, did some qualitative research with a variety of groups within Kaiser Permanente, of which the manuscripts have been submitted for publication, and we discovered certain things. Cultural competency training is essential, and we're embarking on that. Patients want a, a website dedicated for their care that would also provide links to navigating the health system. Kaiser Permanente is not always the easiest health system to navigate. And of course, hiring and training transgender specific case managers and clinicians experience with this care. We're doing all that. But these are other things that all the KP mass, all our providers need to do. Keep all immediate staff informed of how to address your patients. Part of our screens that I didn't emphasize is that we list there how patients want to be referred, what names they want used, what gender identity they want used. We also need to make sure our staff understands the difference between gender identity and sexual orientation. We do want referrals to create case management. We do want to be considered, be understand better clinic behavior. So in fact, there are sometimes jokes or conversations happen in hallways that can be taken the wrong way. This in fact has been found to be critical in our organization and we are combating it daily. Do use their preferred names and of course do ask for pronouns. But we've talked about this as a specific clinic, but of course, not every patient will be in that clinic. We also have talked about, I also have talked about the fact that PrEP has not been uptaken enough in our organization. We're engaging, we're engaging now in broader training for this. But again, the key to for primary care is a few things, because that's where most of these will be ordered. One, uh, we're increasing teaching of colleagues to take a better sexual history and gain greater comfort talking to patients about a healthy sexual life. We're increasing our continuing medical education in this area to increase awareness and action. And as you can see here on the right, through our health system, we're making the right thing to do the easy thing to do by creating smart sets and smart forms that are really just a couple clicks. Most of this is auto-populated, auto-click, so that the physician has to spend less time remembering what to do and more importantly, doing the right thing. This also comes with STD screen. We're creating specific smart sets within our our EPIC that are very easy. So we're making it easier to order STI testing and then treatment without needing to remember everything. We have links to the CDC website and CDC treatment recommendations embedded in the order set. And they're smart. 
We have tailored progress notes and order panel based on patient characteristics, sex, gender, and sexual orientation, tied to the fact if the, if with the SOGI form being filled out a priori. And of course, making the right thing the easy thing to do. So pre-ordered uh, order sets, and in fact, pre-ordered notes that are really more click drop-down boxes, fill in the box. That makes it easier for the physicians to remember what to talk to their patients about, what to ask, and then in terms of also how to treat. We're also increasing with on-demand STI testing. We know that there is related stigma and shame uh, perceived self-shame as a barrier to STI screening. At-risk groups should be screened more, more frequently or if suspected exposure occurs. We know we've talked about the difficulty of these difficult conversations perceived by physicians to have. So sometimes it's easier just to remove the physician or other clinicians from the process. And frankly, this is both a public health and customer service opportunity, especially in areas where STIs are epidemic. So what have we done? Well, we've improved our call center protocol for STI testing, that if a patient calls and says they want an STI panel, the nurse can order it immediately. If the SOGI is not filled out, we are encouraging them to at least ask some basic questions so that the right test can be ordered. But even more of a boon that will be happening uh, like, like this quarter, or early next quarter, is in fact, we're creating an e-visit. So what patients who are hooked up with our patient portal will go on to kp.org. And one of the options is an e-visit, I want STD testing. They will go out, answer a few questions, including making sure the SOGI form is up to date. And then the order for the tests are automatically generated. And there you, on the lower left, you can see the questions that are being, the tests that are being ordered. The other thing we've also done is we've included proved in the last two years, self-collection, that when you order an STD panel, we are including, uh, we are including uh, rectal screening, pharyngeal testing, as well as a urine test for, uh, for genital urinary tract uh, STDs. What this graph shows on the right, uh, the, and we're submitting this for publication, shows there are, well, we were close to missing a thousand cases among men of oropharyngeal as well as rectal uh, gonorrhea and chlamydia if we had only been testing urine. This again emphasizes the importance that. Uh, that swabbing of all these areas, especially self-swabbing, because it's very, it's harder for, for us within a clinic format to get all of this done in an efficient, timely manner. Whereas if in the lab, the patients can have their pharyngeal swabbed easily by the clinic staff and then go to the bathroom and offer, put in a urine sample, as well as self-swabbing of the rectum with instructions posted on the so finally, all of us can practice the six plus P's of talking about your partners, asking about practices, asking about half-past history of STIs, protection, asking about pregnancy prevention or your reproductive life plan. Are you ready to have children? If so, how can we help? Plus discussing pleasure, problems, and of course, pride. So this is a journey, we've come far, but not far enough. Creating a self safe and welcoming space is critical. Start purposely, but you're not gonna finish it all at once. Meet the population where you find them and it has been noted data, data, data. And what I didn't note was we have full leadership support here in our organization for this. And really that means resources. So thank you. Don't think you can't because you can. Thank you for your time and happy to answer any questions. Next, we have Noah Lewis, the director of the Trans Health Project at Transgender Legal Defense and Education Fund, who will be speaking on laws that affect transgender access to care. Thanks, Ryan. So the Trans Health Project, uh, we do, we focus on challenging insurance denials and exclusions for trans-related care. So I just wanted to let you know what we do so that you know that we're a resource. If you have patients who've been denied trans-related care, we focus on public education, so telling people what their rights are, 
uh, movement building that includes teaching providers how to challenge insurance denials and as well as recruiting other attorneys to do this work. We do do direct legal services when people have cases that can create systemic change. And we do policy advocacy with enforcement agencies and insurance companies to try to make systemic changes. So please do use us as a resource. When thinking about laws that affect transgender access to care, we have to step back and we really do have to take into account the social determinants of health that Kellen Baker talks about. So we are talking about things like employment, housing, being able to safely use transportation. These things all directly affect people's ability to access care. Um, you know, do you have legal services that can help you get onto Medicaid, for example, that's going to directly affect your access to care? So with that broad lens in mind, uh, I'll talk about some of the laws affecting uh, trans people. So it's gender dysphoria has inherent legal components in ways that other health conditions don't necessarily. Most transgender people need to legally change their name and gender on their identity documents. So those laws are going to be affecting people. How easy is it to update the sex designation on your driver's license, on your birth certificate? How easy is it to get a legal name change? Are there pro bono name change projects available in your area? Are you aware of those? Do you have uh, referral lists for people to get those uh, services? Do you have, um, do providers know uh, the basics of the legal name and gender process in your area? And you know, what do they know what kind of letters they need to write? Having a template letter for these gender changes is something that's super helpful for, for providers to have. Um, Insurance access is a huge issue for people with gender dysphoria, both simply having access at all and then having access to transgender specific care, which I'll talk about in more detail. Another important uh, component is for people who are coming here because of uh, fear of persecution in their home countries and they may claim asylum on the basis of having gender dysphoria or on the basis of the fact that they came here and transitioned and they can no longer safely return to their home country. There, um, yeah. Another key component uh, is the fact that trans people face widespread discrimination. And so if people are not able to access housing, they're not able to access employment or education because of transgender discrimination, that's going to directly implicate their health. So it's very important for providers to be aware of the myriad protections facing transgender people so that you can refer people to legal help and they can get the assistance that they need to, to resolve those problems so that they're no longer a barrier to access to care. So some of the laws protecting trans people include Section 1557 of the Affordable Care Act, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Fair Housing Act, Title VII, which prohibits discrimination in employment, Title IX prohibits discrimination in education. For certain employers, they're federal contractors, there's extra protections for them. The Constitution applies to any government actor. There are various state insurance laws and bulletins prohibiting trans discrimination and insurance. And there are a lot of very protective state and local non-discrimination laws that apply. Um, I'll just touch on a few of these before going on into more detail about some of them. The Americans with Disabilities Act is a very important piece of protection because it um, applies to public accommodations in all 50 states and it has a, a reasonable accommodation requirement. So that is kind of goes above and beyond just plain discrimination. So if, if, for example, there was a case, it was actually under the state version of the law, but in New York, there was a case where a transgender girl who was in a male group home in a foster facility, she, they had a dress code and she was not allowed to wear skirts and other feminine clothing or wigs. And so she sued under the, the, non, the disability protections and they said that the uh, facility had to give her a reasonable accommodation, meaning that even, even if that policy was the standard policy for everyone else, they had to make an exception because she had gender dysphoria and it was important for her treatment to be able to access uh, 
gender expression that matched her gender identity. The Fair Housing Act, um, you know, there, there was just a, a proposal by the Trump administration to roll back protections for people in shelters to, no, to basically no longer allow transgender women in women's shelters. And so that's a very important law that, you know, to date has protected trans people in the, who are most vulnerable in their housing situations. Um, the Fair Housing Act does apply also to private uh, landlords. So basically, you know, any kind of apartments that are, are being rented. Um, so it's just important to be aware that there are housing protections available. And um, so I'll move on and get into more detail about some of these things. So workplace discrimination, so this applies both to everything from hiring to firing to harassment on the job to being misgendered. People have a right to um, be called by their preferred name, even if they've not had a legal name change. Plenty of people on the job uh, go by nicknames. We have Liz and we have Bob and other people who don't use their legal name. So there's no basis for an employer to say that somebody has to have a legal name change before they can use a preferred name on their name tag or on their email address. The only thing they can do is, you know, issue the check in that name if, if the person's name has not been changed with social security. Um, but intentional misgendering, repeatedly using the wrong pronoun is absolutely prohibited. Um, and same with dress codes, saying that somebody can't comply with a gender dress code if they've not had surgery, something like that is unlawful. If, the, if there's a locker room or bathroom that's sex specific or if the company travels and they house people together in a hotel room, all of those things, a person has to be allowed to use a single sex facility on the basis of their gender identity. And non-binary people are protected as well. If the person has a fluid gender presentation, they are certainly allowed to use different restrooms to have to comply with a different dress code according to their gender presentation that day. Uh, we did just have the Supreme Court case, Bostock versus Clayton County, Georgia. It was very emphatic that transgender status discrimination is sex discrimination and is protected under the law. And the other thing that Title VII protects is insurance. If, it, if an employer, uh, if a person has insurance to their employer, it is Title VII that prohibits a transgender exclusion in that insurance policy. Um, and this is Amy Stevens. She's the one who brought the case to the Supreme Court and um, unfortunately passed away before she saw the huge victory. But we're very grateful for her to uh, putting herself out there and making that change happen. Again, housing, uh, you know, discrimination and poverty is a huge issue. And it's important that um, the people have, you know, get that housing because it has such a huge impact on their um, ability to, to be healthy. Immigration status um, can affect access to care because it's very difficult for undocumented people to get access to health insurance. It's generally not, they're generally not able to access Medicaid, but in some, if it's emergency care, there are ways to argue that the care should be, the trans related care, you know, is an emergency, it should be covered, even if they're not normally eligible for Medicaid. That's a much broader problem than just facing trans people. And it's a, it should be a priority for all advocates to ensure that everyone in this country has access to health care. Transportation is an overlooked area. If somebody is, you know, this is a picture of a trans woman being harassed on the subway. So people are afraid to go to appointments and that's the reality. So anybody, you know, people also have experienced if they're using something like a uh, excess ride, you know, a, a disability um, service to transport them. There's a lot of discrimination there as well when it's just one-on-one -on -one and, you know, they're in a van with somebody. So um, talking with patients, if they're missing appointments, you know, maybe this is a concern and figuring out ways for them to get to appointments is something you can help them with. And of course there are, the, if, it's, if you're in a jurisdiction that has public accommodations protections, that would be unlawful under those laws. 
So you should encourage your patients, anybody who reports problems with discrimination, encourage them to report discrimination. If you're lucky to be in a jurisdiction that has a good local or state uh, human rights commission, that's an excellent place for them. They can get assistance without even having an attorney. The New York City Commission is excellent. Um, Gianna Desir was, she faced um, harassment in getting an apartment. Her landlords, uh, potential landlords started sexually harassing her and refused to rent to her. And uh, she went to the commission and was able to get help that she needed. So definitely encourage people to contact those organizations. In terms of healthcare discrimination, um, this is Alexa Rodriguez. She was denied surgery uh, at a Catholic affiliated hospital, which is very common. And that's kind of the new frontier is all these religious exemptions. But, you know, uh, religiously affiliated hospitals are incredibly common, especially in rural areas, and that is not a justification. These facilities receive federal funding, and if, if they receive federal funding, they are subject to Section 1557, and that means that surgeries cannot be denied because the hospital has an opposition to them. So the current status of Section 1557 is that it is still good law. Absolutely, trans people are protected, meaning that in any healthcare facility, they have to be housed according to their gender identity. So in a drug treatment facility that is sex specific or a hospital room, they have to be housed according to gender identity. People cannot be denied sex specific care under insurance just because their gender marker doesn't match. If, the, if that is happening, you know, the person should uh, do the appeal, but they can also contact an attorney. And finally, there cannot be exclusions in insurance for trans related care. The regulations that uh, the Trump administration is trying to repeal, there are currently five different lawsuits. 24 states, 24 attorneys general are suing um, as part of the lawsuits to stop the repeal of the protective regulations. So hopefully the, those regulations will never be repealed. In, in terms of health insurance denials, people are being denied surgery, hormones, lab work, preventative care. Um, we still see these blanket exclusions, such as sex transformation operations, which it doesn't matter if your care is medically necessary, they're just going to deny it under that exclusion. Medical necessity denials are still common, things like facial surgeries, breast augmentation, hair removal, body contouring, all of these types of denials can be challenged. The, the insurance companies say they are cosmetic, that is not accurate, and that's what I do. You know, in addition to challenging those blanket exclusions, we challenge medical necessity denials and we try to get policy change so that doesn't happen. So nobody should be de being denied care. Again, sex specific care uh, should be covered. If it's being denied, that can be challenged. A little bit more on challenging blanket exclusions. Um, if anybody has some, a blanket exclusion in their plan, if they get a denial letter saying that care is not covered under your plan, you need to immediately refer them to an attorney because only an attorney uh, or some other non-provider uh, mechanism can, can get that changed because it doesn't matter, again, if you prove medical necessity, the exclusion will deny it. So we have this big letter uh, with this comprehensive memo that we send out and we are able to get plans to remove those blanket exclusions. These are some of the places that we've gotten exclusions removed from just by writing a letter. A person doesn't even have to be involved in a lawsuit but if the company or organization doesn't comply, then we, we will sue them. We have a case against the North Carolina State Health Plan for a blanket exclusion in their health plan. And we're suing the Houston County, Georgia, on behalf of Anna Lang, a sheriff's deputy there who's been denied care. So the bottom line is insurance should cover trans-related care. There are many legal protections available to challenge those denials. And I'm happy to field any questions. You can contact me anytime with any legal questions you have specifically around healthcare um, and other issues I can probably give you or throw. So thank you. For our final presentation, we have Michael Carfin, the Senior Deputy Director of the HIV AIDS, Hepatitis, STD, and TB Administration at the District of Columbia Department of Health, will be speaking on local policies to improve STD care. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, thanks to CDC, Gail Bernstein, for inviting me to be on this panel and for uh, sharing the panel with our, our great speakers. Um, 
I, uh, in addition to my position directing the district's uh, HIV, STD, hepatitis, and TB programs, I'm also on the board of the National Coalition of STD Directors, NASTAD, and I serve on the executive committees of the DC Center for AIDS Research and the DC cohort, of which Michael is, uh, Horberg is also uh, a member. So for the remaining portion of our program, I'm going to talk, I'll, I'll give a little snapshot of what STDs are looking like in the District of Columbia, Washington, DC. Um, approach sort of our thematic framework as to how we're transforming our work um, and policies and in program implementation around sex positivity. Talk about those direct service areas that we are influencing by trans in transformation, and then some uh, directions forward. Quickly, in terms of our uh, STD numbers in the district, as, as Michael related, we have a severe epidemic of STDs in the District of Columbia. Our, our rates are three times higher than the national rates on among chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis. And while we've been talking about uh, our total population, these are disproportionately impacting on young people in particular. 50% uh, of our chlamydia are among uh, young people under 24, uh, as well as gonorrhea is from uh, more than half as 18 to 29, uh, and then also gain by sexual men and transgender people. Um, our syphilis in particular is impacting gain by sexual men as three, two thirds of the cases are among, uh, among those men and as well as that more than a third uh, to a half are also living with HIV. Uh, a significant factor is and one of the points I'll get to in the end in terms of where we go with our transformational policies is is that many of these individuals have had previous STIs uh, within the past year half of the uh, the persons diagnosed with syphilis had an STI in the previous year. So our framework for our transformation is sex positivity. Um, you might all recall this salt and pepper song from 1990. Um, and it's uh, through, woven throughout of our efforts to transform our policies around how to reapproach sex because there is a lot of, um, of stigma and shame associated with sex. Uh, as well as with identity, and we need to put that forward um, in our in our contexting our conversations and moving from a disease based model. So here are some of the de uh, definitions that we've been using uh, with respect to sex positivity. Um, but basic the fundamental concepts of these are is that this is open, non judgmental, and that we have trust in our conversations. Uh, as well as that we're culturally affirming about the identities uh, of the individuals of which our policies and programs are intended to serve. Uh, when we also talk about sex positivity, we've, we, we can't as, as well as what the previous speakers have been um, has been a well addressing is that there's an intersectionality between sex and uh, the uh, multiple identities that people are experiencing, um, as well as many of the other factors that um, we've been hearing in terms of social determinants of health, um, that we have to approach this as a whole person model. And that has been a guide for our application of this of using the sexual health model, for instance, um, as, as a, a key fundamental of our approach. Uh, and I refer to the power of the P because uh, while we talk about that as could be many different P's as which you wish to define, um, prevention, protection, but pleasure is an important element of that. And that again, addresses the stigma and, uh, that is associated with sex. So where do we have to start? We have to start with our own, with our own house, which is our STD clinic. I, I tend to make this joke that you remember this television program, Cheers, where everybody knows your name. Well, that's not necessarily the way STD clinics have operated. It certainly wasn't in our, in our city. It was basically where you didn't want anyone to know your name. And, and what we've transformed from is where we were located, and that's a sign on the, on the left there, uh, was on a, on a campus, a part of this, were also homeless shelters, detox, 
um, a, a prison. Um, people would get lost trying to find our, our clinic, um, uh, trying to weave their way through this, this property. That's not a way to really affirm someone's sexual health. And so now we've moved that to uh, a, a much more uh, discreet and uh, location of the city, central location of the city, and we changed our name from the Southeast STD Clinic to the DC Health and Wellness Center. And what we've done in that transformation is moved from just what, what would have been defined as a categorical STD clinic and moved into a much more comprehensive sexual health um, service center. Um, we, where we've integrated not only um, STD screening and treatment, but also HIV, uh, hepatitis, where we've um, made PrEP as a key part of our program. We had over uh, 6,600 visits in 2019, 890 of them are for PrEP. We had over 600 people are currently on our PrEP practice. And we've also uh, uh, preventive health as well in terms of vaccination. Well, over 300 uh, individuals that we were able to uh, provide the HPV uh, vaccine. And then we've also integrated into, uh, into our program reproductive health because we found many young people who've come to us are like, they want everything when they uh, walk through the door. So we've added reproductive health as well, both counseling and, uh, and, and actual uh, birth control measures. Um, and uh, lastly, I would add, and then particular piece is that it, as we are addressing people uh, holistically, that many of the stresses and anxieties and traumas that uh, people have experienced that also bring them into, an, into a sexual health clinic has been uh, a providing on-site uh, professional counseling to help people, and that has become an increasingly popular element of our of our care. And then at a citywide level, um, we've uh, been for the past ten years. We've had different community-based screening. Uh, opportunities to reduce barriers um, uh, for particularly for young people with regard to schools. Um, uh, over a thousand young people uh, uh, we screened in our in our high schools. Over 3,500 young people and youth community partner sites that are youth focused uh, partners. We're in the process now of of reconceiving that school-based program because uh, we've been doing it for 10 years and we need to look at more. Uh, innovative approaches to that. We've implemented uh, currently, and this is somewhat related to the COVID experience that we're having now, of a, a sort of modified express clinic at our health and wellness center where people come in, spend less than about 10 minutes doing self-collection, uh, and then uh, we give them the results uh, within uh, several days. Uh, we're also taking that self-collection piece further into a home-based environment. Uh, uh, Michael mentioned, I want the kit, but the, the district itself, we are launching our own uh, STD home kit program. Uh, we've, all, we've started already with HIV test kits through uh, a new platform called getcheckdc.org. And now we're uh, moving in terms of the telehealth environment uh, and creating an entire um, uh, suite of prep services uh, virtually. Uh, we were able to get a policy in the district that schools, that condoms would be allowed to be uh, disseminated in schools. What is in process and proposed, I think, are some very somewhat controversial ideas that we've had around, um, for instance, uh, applying the sexual health minor consent law to uh, allow young people to get the HPV vaccine. Um, also, we've uh, suggested, of which we haven't yet achieved, the, the notion that uh, high school students would be able, would be required to have an STD screen before entering as part of the universal health certificate. And as I mentioned before, that, uh, that stress and anxiety uh, aspect that people are experiencing, we wanna bring that citywide with a new wellness initiative. In terms of treatment transformation, um, we've piloted a new program uh, around having a, a nurse practitioner be able to move to different community sites to offer more treatment options uh, for uh, for our for our residents and area residents. Um, 
the uh, we started this in January, um, and uh, we've had to we did postpone some of that, but we're resuming that service uh, even while we're still in the pandemic here. But a quote from uh, one of the uh, at Latin American Youth Center, where uh, the practitioner has uh, provided services, having the NP from DC Health has been a huge success at LAYC because our youth have access to the service. We have been able to link more youth to birth control and STI treatment. I'm truly grateful for all of the wonderful work Chrissy, our NP, has done over the last nine months. And then we've been working on a new model around expedited partner therapy. Um, for instance, based on one part as we pass a law around having EPT in the district, but it has not really fully realized its potential. Um, one of uh, a recent study that was done at Children's National Medical Center found that um, nearly half of young people who came through the emergency department for STI testing who got a prescription did not fill that prescription. So we're now piloting a new project where we are providing the medication uh, directly to those providers so that young people can be able to obtain or, or uh, can obtain the, the treatment and, and refer their partners for that treatment. Uh, in terms of outreach and engagement, uh, we've transformed that as well, and particularly as we've heard from a lot of our engagement in the community, that connection is an important element um, in the sexual health um, uh, field uh, and, and their experience. Um, we developed a whole uh, peer network program. You can see the numbers of, uh, of young people that have been participating in that, where they are paid, and that's an important element of this. Um, and we established a program called RAP MC, which is RAP, uh, the MC stands for Master of Condoms. Uh, and we developed an online platform in order to train and certify uh, young people and adults to be condom educators. We looked around in the field, didn't find any similarity, similar uh, model, and we developed our own. And then uh, an important part Part of our work is also a priority focus is around trusted adults because young people have said very clearly that they need a source of credible non-judgmental information so barring from literature we have developed a whole training curriculum um, and discussion guide that we've published to talk about that and empower both young people and adults to talk about their sexual health and hear some of their voices directly when it comes to sex, I would like to talk to my trusted adult about how to help you seek good sex experience. About understanding. About the first half. And how it should go. Not getting called up. About, I don't even know. About healthy relationships. About why it's hard for them to talk to me about sex in the first place. About how to be protected from hearts. About how I can be supported by my doctors. About everything. <laughs> Uh, those are members of our Youth Advisory Board. And then in terms of the converse, transforming the conversation around sexual health is utilizing social marketing, and we've created two different platforms, one sexual being, um, uh, and in Spanish, bienestar, DC, uh, and, that, and that's around a general population. And then for youth, we've created sex is because, as you heard from young people themselves, defining what sex is for them is a continual process, uh, and that we want to affirm that that those that those uh, their sexual health. And we've created another online resource for people to be able to access services called linkyoudmv.org. Uh, um, in terms of our outreach and engagement, this is another area where we've kind of stepped, uh, push, pushed up against the border of, of, of what health departments do. We've created a whole uh, track of around sexual health workshops uh, where we've created spaces where in, in collaboration with community partners, we've had app open conversations about sex. Um, and that, and again, not done in the disease approach, but in terms of an empowerment approach around um, sexual health and, and, and choices. Um, 
using storytelling as a very a platform of that. Um, you can see in the, on the right there, there's an ad for the Smut Slam DC, which is a monthly conversation about sex. Um, several of us from the health department served as judges uh, on, in a contest of that to talk of uh, hearing their stories and, and uh, awarding prizes. Uh, it was quite an experience. Um, and then we've also created, um, in terms of uh, outreach um, that's focused on young people around creating conversation spaces to have those safe and again open and non-judgmental um, as well as having fun that's an important element of this and even though health departments are not always considered the fun people in the room that's what we've been uh, aiming to achieve and, and lastly, in terms of our next steps, um, is continuing this transformation in terms of what our goals are and how to measure the impact of our collective efforts uh, around addressing STDs in, in Washington, D.C. Better defining what metrics that can help us achieve those goals, how to monitor and disseminate and share that uh, with our community um, to, again, achieve a, a continuous quality improvement, creating learn, a learning co collaboratives, and then as well a community of practice that we can overall provide more access for sexual health in this non-stigmatizing uh, and uh, open fashion. And lastly, I wanna thank uh, the team here at the Department of Health and our community partners um, and uh, my, there's my contact information. And as well, because we are in a COVID environment, we actually issued a guidance around COVID and sex, um, which you can see uh, uh, illustrated there. So uh, thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to all of our presenters today as well. The presenters from today's session will be available for a live question and answer session that will be held at 3.30 p.m. Eastern time on September 18th that will be accessible through the conference website. This concludes this session. Thank you for joining and have a great rest of your day.